Uh, welcome to Never Rewrite. I'm Isaac Askew. And I'm Jeffrey Sherman. And today we are rejoined by in our first ever two-part episode uh, by Adil Farad, Farid, sorry, uh, mm-hmm. who is going to continue telling us about his adventures being uh, creating a digital ticketing service for the Indian Railways in the 1980s. Uh, Adil, we're going to remind our listeners where we left off. All right. So uh, yesterday we talked about uh, the uh, conditions, the situations, the geopolitical uh, challenges, the limitations of the hardware, the the economic state of the country. So, and the lack of uh, the training in the specific discipline of the computer science. So. Uh, when this system was being designed, the country was facing a lot of challenges and the country was going through a lot of uh, uh, turbulence in terms of uh, its uh, positioning itself in the uh, geopolitical, uh, on the geopolitical map. So uh, IBM was uh, doing its business in India, a lot of American companies, but because of the socialist revolution in the country, those companies were forced out of the country and there were a lot of uh, restrictions on import by the government the indian government itself and by the uh, by the american and the european uh, uh, governments so under those circumstances this particular ticketing system was uh, designed developed and implemented it was one of its kind very unique system it's online transaction processing system in real time so uh, I, and I should of course, remind the listeners, the, especially the younger listeners, uh, when you say online, this is a network of a couple mainframes and some terminals, you know, text only terminals. This is not there is no Internet. The Internet will not there, the World Wide Web will not be invented for another 15 ish years. There is mm-hmm. Internet, but there is no World Wide Web. There are no websites. There's email. <laughs> Correct. So uh, the way the system was uh, designed and available to the common public was, yes, there were super mini, as we used to call these super mini VAX, VMS systems, and all the terminals were connected to the hard wire. So basically, there were very, very long Ethernet cables on which these terminals were were sitting. And uh, yes, there was no fancy GUI environment available but we managed to have a proper form. Proper forms were there, they were not character based. They were like proper form, there were fields. So you could see it on the screen itself and uh, we leverage the terminal hardware capabilities through the escape sequences and highlighting the specific areas of the screen and then the cursor positioning, capturing the, uh, the terminal input. So there was a lot of programming done in terms of designing those, quote unquote, the GUI environment. And yet there were a lot of validations. So it was a form-based system, online online system. So uh, if you happen to enter in, into, the, uh, into the, the reservation center, as we used to call it, you'll find uh, just like a whole lot of ticketing agents are sitting around and they are sitting in front of a terminal. Through mm-hmm. which they are entering the entering the data and the data capture was the passengers or whoever wishes to reserve a ticket they will have to fill out a physical form hand over that form to the clerk the clerk will duplicate that information typing into the information uh, uh, typing the information into the system and then it will uh, create the uh, create the ticket or do the reservation so that was so, the front end right and so. We left off last time. We had talked about how, you know, the the DBAs had ad- added too many users to the system, and it caused a crash and a riot that required the national, the Indian National Guard to come out and restore order, just because mm-hmm. you ran out of RAM uh, and that the system went down. Uh, we talked about how ticketing wa- uh, was locked for twenty seconds in order to print a ticket, and mm-hmm. if it didn't print. Uh, that person was out, you know, that was out of luck. And so you had a case, which is, I think, where we left off, where the, the printer was in was bad. And somebody had waited three days in line to get a ticket. And 
they got there and they had filled out their form and everything was right, but the printer was bad. So they lost their ticket and then they had to wait another day in line. And you had described how heartbreaking that was. And I think we left off with that. You then went back and changed, uh, um, the operational procedure to, you know, make sure that everybody tested their printer before the, the ticket window opened in the morning. Can we keep going along the lines of, you know, now, okay, so you've got the ticket windows open. And if I remember stories from when we, we used to work together and you would tell me these things, as soon as you gave, told the ticketing agents that you, they had the ability to print things before the tickets opened, you immediately ran into a corruption issue. Where they That would... is correct. So, uh, yes, so during our conversations with the union leaders and others, so they were constantly asking us the uh, questions around what can system track? Mm -hmm. What are its capabilities in terms of the the timing, the reporting, etc.? And we didn't realize the depth of those questions after, uh, you know, uh, until much after, much, much later when we realized that um, when the system became operational. And one thing I would like to mention that the union concern was the computers or the implementation of this system is going to cost uh, the jobs for the for the booking clerks because they were under the impression that the computers were, will be doing all the work and therefore there will be no need of uh, having these uh, human mm -hmm. uh, reservation clerks. And that was uh, proved to be very, very, very wrong because when the system became operational and it uh, brought the ease in terms of booking a, uh, a, a ticket, before that people had to wait like four hours, five hours in front of the window with the first implementation of the system when we, do the, when we did the time study, the queue in or, and queue out, the average time was, average wait time any individual would spend is about 20 minutes. So a person joined the queue wow. or the line, and then by the time he gets the ticket, a printed ticket in his hand, that was our criteria, it was 20 minutes. So we did the time study, and that was, so it was a big, big, huge success in terms of bringing in the comfort and the confidence of the people that, uh, yes, I can go there and I don't have to spend my entire day I can just get in and out within 20, 25 minutes. And as a result of that, the result of that, the system became very popular. And then the government or Indian Railways ended up hiring one full shift of the operators. So it was before that they were running two shifts. Now they started to run three shifts and they had to mm. hire additional people. So it created the jobs. It created more jobs, put it that way. Interesting. And then I remember from earlier from conversation yesterday where there simply weren't enough trains for all the people who wanted to go, which is why people would wait in line two, three days out mm -hmm. to book a ticket 60 days in the future. That, you know, simply reducing the line time didn't change the fact that there simply weren't enough tickets. There weren't enough trains and there weren't enough seats. That, so that is correct. Computerizing that is didn't do anything there. Mm -hmm. Computerization simply eased the pain on the people, those who wanted to travel, those who wished to travel, and they could not uh, uh, found themselves courageous enough to go out and weather this kind of chaotic situation to get the get get through the lines and fight off uh, to get the ticket or spend enormous amount of money to get the tickets. So a lot of corruption was there, so they could not. Now the people People got encouraged that hey, it is much easier. I can go there and I can simply purchase my ticket in a reasonably, you know, uh, reasonable amount of time. So that that was that. And coming to the corruption part of it. So before the the the, the computerization of the system. So of course the tickets were pre-printed, paper tickets, and they were hogged by the the clerks and those who were offered the bribe, they will be sold on the black market. So that was happening. But now with the computerization, there was no pre-printed ticket. The ticket has to be printed by the printer. That was so it, that was the first step in reducing the corruption. Mm. However, 
then of course the human beings are smarter than the computers. It is always a, is a race between the man and machine. So people found, okay, if that be the case, I will come in early. I will come at five o'clock, six o'clock, and I will mm -hmm. print a ticket. I will book the tickets with some fake names and IDs. And later on, you know, the system allowed certain modifications, which we started to turn off later on. Like we call it like a correction in name and age kind of things. So uh, people or the, a lot of clerks started to print the uh, tickets or do the reservation before the center would open. The center would open on uh, uh, on weekdays at 9 a.m. and on week uh, weekends at 10 a.m. So uh, this is what started to happen. And I'm, I was, I'm really, really happy. Even in those uh, deep layers of uh, corruption, there were some really, really honest officers. So uh, one of the uh, officer I was working with, Mr. A.K. Awasti, and then he uh, called me up and uh, in our evening meetings, we used to have daily evening meetings around 4.30, 5 p.m. just to go over uh, what has happened, what can we do to improve the system, what are the challenges, new functionality, et cetera. So during that meeting, he asked me, uh, that uh, we have been running some uh, reports and looks like there are over 600, 700 tickets are being uh, issued before 6 a.m. What is going on? <laughs> <laughs> the center is Clearly it's open. a bug. <laughs> the center is not even open. What's going on? And of course, uh, you know, the report would clearly show the terminal number, the person who is logged in there, it's, it's mm -hmm. identified, etc. So it was it was a significantly detailed detailed enough report to um, figure out what was going on there. When you say six seven hundred tickets, if I remember earlier uh, yesterday, you were saying the daily ticket number daily ticket rates were somewhere in the order of four or five thousand tickets a day. So this is almost almost this is over ten percent. Right in, in in the initial phase, but when yeah. the, when fully the system became fully functional, then the the number of tickets those were issued in a day it reached like uh, forty to fifty thousand tickets. Oh wow! Yeah, so it, it did reach to uh, that 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 level. So that's interesting. So, so the the digital ticketing allowed you to do about eight or nine x the total number of tickets sold. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that before trains would leave with empty seats? just became worthless or did the ticketing like in the u.s there's conductors on the cars and if you don't have a ticket he's got a book and he'll punch you out a ticket right there that's was, that's that what something... was happening mostly that's what was happening mostly so and and of course that was all cash there was no credit card mm. there was no credit card there was no check writing etc it was all cash dealing and mm -hmm. cash dealing you know how it goes cash dealing uh, it, it 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 has a lot of big opening for, for corruption, right? There is no accountability, et cetera. So uh, with this one, when we uh, started looking at those reports and Mr. Avasti said that, what can we do to prevent this thing from happening? And then I said, well, in the computer, we have a lot of opportunities. We computer can check the time. It knows what time of, uh, of the day it is and it can uh, prevent from uh, the transaction from going forward. He said, okay. And uh, I remember that it was uh, Friday evening or Saturday, uh, you know, Friday evening. So I spent the entire night mm -hmm. writing, uh, <laughs> writing, writing the, uh, the code. And it was a very interesting name. And then one of the, and I, it was kind of funny name too, because one of my uh, hardware colleagues came around, because we used to go for dinner together. He said, okay, mm -hmm. what are you doing? I said, you know, I had a meeting with Mr. Avasti, so I'm not going home to, by the way, we were all young at that time, you know, all the engineers, uh, unmarried, and most of us were living with our parents. So we didn't have, and there, there was really not much to do outside. So we used to spend nearly 16, 17, sometimes even days on site itself. We would not go home. We would not even go home. We would just stay and decide. We were given given the room and then we were given the uh, the perks in terms of you can go out for, for free, free breakfast, lunch and dinner. So we were just there just working. 
Some things and, never change. Young engineers. The original hackathon. <laughs> uh, and, and I should point out here that you're talking about, uh, so the, the system only ran when the tickets windows were open, which you said was like nine to five or 10 to five, depending upon the day. Mm -hmm. And so you're now pulling an, an all nighter. And it's not that you don't, you don't even have enough computers to have a second environment. So you are hacking all night on a Friday night in production. That is correct. Yes, that was correct. So we were all the, even all the development work. So all the, you know, as we were writing the code, all the compilation would be happening on the same system as the production boxes. So there was no no second environment <laughs> in the same. And there were like uh, eight developers uh, on my team. Mm -hmm. And there were other, uh, uh, the operational uh, staff, the database maintainer, the report generator, the chart generator, Everything was happening on the same super mini computer within that small amount of RAM. So uh, that was, and then uh, I have to give credit to the deck engineers too, that you know they wrote the VMS that that was really robust, right? It did survive that kind of uh, utilization, that kind of usage. Hmm. So uh, really good hardware. So I distracted you. So you spent all night. You you wrote up this funny named thing. Yes. You may so or may it was, uh, the name was uh, okay. So uh, all the you know the, the processes would come up, and then I would call it. I said you know I, what should I call it? So there was the functionality of uh, you know the process hibernation. Process hibernation. So the process is in hiber. So it's, remember that you still have to boot. The, it was a, basically the way it was architected was there may be like 100 users, but mm -hmm. all 100 users are sharing exactly the same process address space. Remember, we don't have much memory through the, it's called global maps mm -hmm. in uh, VMS uh, uh, jargon. Uh, so it was all loaded. So it, the MCP, the master control program is simply loaded in memory. And all of these child, there was not like separate process for each user. Each user will be having a slice or a time slice into that master control uh, process. So there was hmm. only one process. So still we had to uh, bring up that process. We had to load all the train data, all the route data, all the uh, availability ticket, you know, the 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 uh, the car data, the uh, routes data. So all this static data needs to be loaded. And of course, you know, some of the data was uh, dynamic, but some of the, a lot of data was static. So we just would map it in a specific chunk of, or dedicated uh, chunk of memory. And all of these, uh, the logins will be simply sharing all that information. That's how we managed it. So it was not like everybody is having a private copy of that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the hibernation was a concept that you can put a process into a hibernation state. The process will be up, loaded in memory, but it will not be allowed to run if the process is hibernating. It will not be allowed to run. It is like suspending a process, put it that way. Okay. So, uh, uh, so I wrote that uh, uh, routine called uh, UT. All the utility functions were named with uh, the letters UT. So UT, hiber till eight or nine, depending upon whether it is Sunday or not. So that was the that was the name of the Fortran subroutine. And then it, that became the longest name, <laughs> longest name in the system. So uh, yes, so that, that's how uh, we started to uh, control the tickets from being issued before the system opens. But that present a day a smaller challenge and, and in fact you know when i was writing that code my uh hardware buddy then he said that okay you're writing this thing what is the what is the use i said the use is of course we are going to reduce the corruption and it is going to uh, create a uh, level field for everybody to get their their fair right to have a ticket uh, and it will of course eliminate uh, a lot of bribery. Then he said that, okay, you know, what are you talking about? But he started to be a little bit more aggressive. He said, what are you talking about? 
you know that such and such and such and such person, they are working with these ticket clerks. So there it is, you were talking about the insider corruption. So mm. There were some individuals, the inside said, like, look at these, you know, I have myself, you know, because hardware and software India, we used to go on a round. We used to take a round mm -hmm. just to check how the system is running, if anybody needs any help, you know, like like that. So he said that many a times when I was uh, on the round, this this guy, he was talking to the uh, the black sell, you know, black market uh, uh, sellers, and then he was facilitating the this kind of uh, things. So I said, regardless, now mm. I'm actually limiting even his ability, even his ability to go through this route because he's not. Nobody will be able to print the ticket at uh, 6 a.m. And when we open the uh, system, uh, say, at uh, 9 a.m. sharp, mm -hmm. how many tickets maximum we are going to lose? Think about that. Even if you assume that all the cl clerks are corrupt, so we have about <laughs> nine, that we had that time 90. So maximum, we are limiting our loss to 90. That everybody is like prepared before the center open and so they can have only one ticket only one ticket illegally right you know when the mm -hmm. system uh, system opens so at the opening it is a fair game for everybody right so uh, so we are limiting of course we are not eliminating it but we are reducing the amount of corruption and that's that's what happened i said human beings will always find to go around the system mm -hmm. and then so, you know, so uh, and we cannot help. So we are doing our best effort to just limit this um, uh, kind of practices. And I said, I really don't care whether in, in the database, you know, in, in the area if that guy's corrupt. I'm working with Mr. Avasti and we have full support. And he's the top guy. He's the top guy. And I'm sure he's aware of what's happening around him, but his hands are tied too. He can do only so much to limit the corruption. But I'm happy that he's supporting us. That's the reason I'm, I didn't go home today. I'm right I'm here writing the code and then I'll be uh, able to implement. And then once we implement it, we uh, do the little bit of testing, verification, and then we off to, off to uh, uh, the production rollout. So there was no separate QA. We were the developers, we were the QA, we were the verifiers. And what happened when that system went out? Because I assume, you know, well, I don't assume, but you didn't have product notices and whatnot. It just, the system worked differently the next day. So did the, was there screaming and yelling from the clerks? Oh, yes, yes, yes. A lot of, a lot of uh, clerks, they started to call the, we used to call the console room. Mm -hmm. So the console room uh, phone started to buzz like, hey, what happened? I'm not able to log in. And of course, they were told that time that uh, yes, this is the expected behavior and you won't be able to uh, proceed until, you'll be able to log on, but you won't be able to do anything until uh, 9 a.m. or 10, if it is Sunday. So yeah, that, that time they were told. Did you get any physical threats? Because I imagine in the US, <laughs> you, you would, just in my head, Stories like this often, and then a mobster shows up and threatens to break your legs if you don't undo the fix. That, that <laughs> happened only once, and not the physical threat, but uh, a different kind of threat. Uh, what was happening was when the uh, phase two was rolled out. So mm -hmm. phase one was all terminals, right? And then we had the uh, the reservation cancellation a little bit of modifications and the inquiry module. Inquiry module was very, very buggy. So I spent a lot of time on the inquiry module, basically to check the availability, the status. What is the status? How many tickets are available in real time? Mm. So uh, once that, because that was really, really crucial because that in my view was going to provide the transparency, the accuracy of the, the, the state of the system. And once we implemented that a year uh, and it was fully operational, working very, very precisely and accurately, we implemented another system and that was through, all, and of course that time we didn't overload the CPUs, the, the main CPUs, mm -hmm. but we brought in the 386 boxes, 386 boxes running an operating system called Minix. I don't know if you have heard that one say. Yeah, I think Minix was the thing that, they were playing with that eventually became Linux. Linux. 
Yes. Yeah. So because we bought in there, and then we started to uh, we uh, we uh, crafted a system, and attached a TV monitor. So now a real monitor in which the the data can be entered for the ticketing mm -hmm. is now facing the clerk. But still, the there was a level of corruption that what screen was showing was different from what the lips were saying. Ah. If the screen may show the availability, but the clerk is still telling that it's a wait list, mm. right? Or it may be the clerk knows that there are, you know, three trains are leaving for this destination. One train is full, so it will purposefully just enter the one which is full, and it will say that oh, it is it is showing wait list, knowing that the other train has uh, the availability, right? So. Yeah. With the second level, when we put the this this um, uh, Unix uh, machines and have the TV monitors attached to it, that was facing the customers. Now, what clerk is typing is visible to the customers. The so people were able to see. So that brought in a little bit more transparency. So the clerk cannot enter a different turn number. Immediately, passenger would question, hey, you didn't enter that one. If that be the case, you you just check the the alternative uh, av availability. So this is what this was another level of reducing the, the the corruption. I love it. And this this is the one where mobsters came and threatened you, or no? Then no. that was another. <laughs> uh, just give me a second. <laughs> I, I I love this. This is the you know the iterative, just bringing <laughs> visibility into the system and. The the sunshine, you know, produces the effect of of reduce because people don't want to be taken advantage of, and so mm -hmm. the, by removing the power of the knowledge of the of control of mm -hmm. the knowledge, you without you know bring you don't need to bring bring police into this to tell the the ticketing agents not to be corrupt. It's just if if people see the ticketing agents are being corrupt with them, mm -hmm. then they're able to fight back themselves. Correct. The transparency uh, uh, allows uh, uh, us to reduce the corruption, right? The monitoring, the, the, the transparency is important. So what happened was when the system grew and then we expanded beyond one location. Now people had to come to Bombay, Mumbai in a physical center where they had to uh, book their tickets. Mm -hmm. But people are coming from long distance. So we started expanding that by extending the physical communication lines to a different, you know, 15 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles into that one. So we create, started to create, we call the uh, satellite locations. I mean, mm -hmm. we had a definition of the remote location and satellite location. We had a specific definition. Satellite location will basically fall into the nearby vicinity of the main center, and it would not involve a day-night flip when the train travels through that that that, that loca location. Mm. There should not be any day-night flip. If a distance is such that the day boundary changes, then we would call that as a remote location, remote location. For instance, uh, and um, there was another uh, term we used to the pure location. For example, Bombay was a center because Indian Railway has many branches: the central branch, the southern branch, the northern, the northern region. So it was divided into regions. Mm -hmm. So the Hyderabad was part of the central region. Bombay was part of central region. Madras was. So these were all independent systems. Now these were all the same software, but independent uh, uh, systems. They would have their own database. They would have their own. Uh, terminal setup, they have on everything was like independent of each other, so regional basis. Mm -hmm. In the phase uh, two, we started to expand our satellite location, basically physically extending the communication lines and just setting up the terminals. There is no computers on there. They're still talking to the mainframe super minis sitting at the Mumbai location. So that was still the case. And then the Third phase came in whereby we had to connect a distant location that we call remote, where the possibility of day and night change. So Ahmedabad was one such location, and we started to bring in more uh, networking hardware. That time I started to learn a lot about the mesh network, 
uh, muxes and uh, switches, etc. And there was a political reason why Ahmedabad was pushed to, to that um, particular uh, choice, that why we have to implement. So there was a lot of the railway ministry was involved, home ministry mm. was involved, so it was up in the ministry. And there was a competing location called Pune, which was nearby. And it was, I mean, Pune is, it is called the university town, just like Boston, a lot of universities, a lot of, uh, and it's a, uh, you know, a lot of defense facilities are there. So politically it had some cloud, but not enough to compete with, uh, with the Ahmedabad location. And Pune was much easier to implement because we had to just pull the, in, in terms of the software, because we didn't have to write the customization uh, or the specific logic for the day night uh, flip, because a, a, a reservation logic was very, very complex. Remember, especially when we crossed the day boundary. Right, because the train, some of them would turn into sleeper cars, which meant that seats would disappear. So you couldn't sell seats yep. that needed to be overnight. Overnight, yes. So knowing these facts, one day I was called by somebody in his office that on Saturday morning, he said that, you know, come on, come on, come on, have a seat. Then he offered the cookies and tea and said that, uh, what do you think? How difficult would it be to implement uh, the system in Pune? I said, uh, Pune is uh, very easy. That time we were already in full swing in terms of development for Ahmedabad. Mm -hmm. So his guy, he wanted to push Pune first so that he gets significant significant chunk of funding. And then, <laughs> of course, I have mentioned that funding comes this much. And by the time it starts to come to implementation, it, it starts to shrink because the layers are taken off as it moves, moves down from department to department and person to person. Mm -hmm. So uh, I said Pune is uh, relatively easier. All we have to do is uh, just pull the communication links and then we can uh, set up the terminal. And then um, I got the call from my head office saying that uh, we heard that you made a commitment to implement Pune before Ahmedabad. And uh, <laughs> uh, now you you know you you know we we have an internal meeting for that one. So I was there like, no, why did you, uh, I said, I did not commit. I was asked a question, like how easy it is. And I said, it's easy enough. Just we have to pull the, why do we have to give that kind of idea? Why do we even say that it's easy? <laughs> it is not. And that that became a very, very, very uh, a challenging thing. And I was, I never faced this kind of situation just out of college, living with my parents and, you know, getting into that situation. And then uh, it it you know you you could imagine how big of a deal that was, because uh, the you know the somebody's political future was uh, relying upon that aspect of the system. If the Pune goes before Ahmedabad, then of course somebody else will be not only getting the whole chunk, lot of chunk of money, but also the the political a lot of political gain. So mm -hmm. it a lot of things were at stake, like what goes first, right? What go, what goes first? So and then, of course, the politics in India is is not uh, free of violence. So people do resort to a lot. It's not just small; a lot of violence, even at the smaller level. So it it was, and this particular thing was uh, connected with with really the the, the big shots of, of the time. So uh, yes, it was. I I was really shaking inside out. I said, "Okay, oh my mm -hmm. God, what have I gotten into?" So and of course, not just me, my mm -hmm. my team, my managers, my company, and a lot of people were, you know, of course, the pressure was coming from all all, all the directions. So it was a bit of a challenge. Yeah, the proverbial padding your estimates. This <laughs> it all. It's all so much more intense. Than, than these days where I, I could I have I have walked into a similar trap uh, about timing and what goes first but the certainly there were no stakes <laughs> nobody's careers were on the line and mm -hmm. there was no fear of violence oh. should should I have stuck you know should I have put my foot in it and ruined somebody's day um I feel like we could keep going on forever because I know from our past history that we've 
done some, you know, you've got so many amazing stories, but I think we should uh, cut it off here and maybe mm -hmm. bring you back another time if, if people love the stories as much as I do. Because oh, uh, I, to me, and I was telling Isaac before the show, working with you uh, was one of the things that showed me how to be empathetic as a developer. And if it, people take anything away from the series, it's, or I would love for them to take away the idea that, look, you're, you're going to write code and the code is the code, but your code has impact on people in the real world. You can make their lives better. You can make their lives worse. <laughs> right. You can bring, you can, you could have coded in corruption, right? You could have probably made yourself, I don't know, fabulously wealthy, but you could have certainly for somebody who was unmarried and living at home, made it easier to print tickets and gotten yourself a kickback for it uh, and, and put a lot of money in your own pocket. Mm -hmm. And so those are the pressures that I hope he, we bring to the fore with this series, but just, you know, our work matters beyond the bits and the code. Hey, Im imagine the situation that somebody is in, uh, has come to Mumbai or, or some big city for work. And uh, his ailing parents are somewhere uh, in a distant remote village, right? And this poor guy does not have uh, any means, other means to travel to, uh, to, to see his, his father or mother taking the last breath, right? You know, on, mm -hmm. on, the, on the deathbed. And imagine if he's unable to get the ticket in time. So how big of an impact it could make on a life. If somebody is an elderly person, for example, and if he or she has to come and stand in the line for hours and hours, it is taking a toll on the health, right? Breaking right. the mm -hmm. back, unable to unable to stand. And it could, I mean, we cannot really understand the true depth and true, uh, uh, you know, deep impact it could have, but facilitating that like 20 minutes in and out, you're making the things easy. Plus, uh, if you are standing there, if you're frustrated, if you have other things to do, then it, it, you, you could become angry. And that anger and frustration could be taken out on the person next to you. And a lot of fights could break out. And the fights could erupt into violent fights. Two people could lose, lose, uh, lose lives in there or could get really seriously hurt. But facilitating these things, you are eliminating that kind of frustration, that kind of stress on, on, on your head, right? So you're not just writing the code. If you write the code with the purpose to serve the humanity, how you make a, how you can make the things easy upon people, then uh, of course, uh, yes, you are getting paid for your efforts, but there are a lot of tangibles repayment because what you pour in will eventually turn around and come back to back to you. Because this is what I was thinking when I was looking at the people standing in the line. I imagine my father said, oh, this is what was happening. He was mm -hmm. going to get the ticket. And then, then that was the reason uh, why we could not travel as a family a lot of time. When the things started to open up, you know, we could travel uh, as a family to the nearby location. We could have a family vacation. Before that, it was nearly impossible. So we, I mean, we have a family vacation, get together. It actually is good for your your uh, social well-being, good for your health. It it reduces the stress. It uh, enhances your relationship with your with your parents, with your siblings. So writing the code is one thing, but you could imagine the social impact, the physical mm -hmm. impact, the health-wise impact, and reducing the corruption, etc. You could you could imagine how big of an impact uh, you know your lines of code could bring. Mm -hmm. So writing the code with the purpose. Yes. Uh, so thank you so much. So if people wanted to reach out and get in touch with you, uh, what would be the best way for them to find you? So you can share my phone number, which you already have, or you can they can reach out to me uh, using my email. So. Okay. So uh, and you're also on LinkedIn. I should throw. I'm out also there. on LinkedIn. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Right, we'll put the LinkedIn in the show notes. That way people can find you. Okay. Yeah, that'll be great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been one of my favorite shows. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Sherman. And I'm Isaac Askew. And this is Never Rewrite. <laughs>